All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation's Skid Compass panel discussion, A Carrier's Perspective. My name is Emma Mertens, and I'm the Program Manager of Community Relations at IDF. On behalf of all of us at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this program. We are excited to host this panel for the IDF community. IDF is dedicated to fostering a community empowered by education. We want you to remember that IDF is committed to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered and offer you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your journey. Today's program is part of IDF's regular series of bite-sized programming that will provide diagnosis-specific information and support to our community wherever they may be. Before we begin, I would like to point out a few housekeeping items to keep in mind for today's program. This evening, we are using the Zoom webinar feature. Attendees should be able to see the slides and our panelists and be able to hear myself and our panelists. Attendees will not be able to activate their video camera or their microphone. There will be the opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation, and you are welcome to submit any questions you have for the panel as you think of them throughout the session. Please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. Please do not include any personal health information, as all questions will be anonymous and read aloud. A brief disclaimer. Please remember the information presented during this forum is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We are here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational forum or event. Many of you tuning in today are doing so because you are an individual, parent, caregiver, or friend to someone living with severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID. SCID Compass, an educational program of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, is designed to guide parents of infants diagnosed with SCID, people living with SCID, and the medical community through the journey of learning about this rare, life-threatening medical disorder and find support to navigate the health challenges along the way. Skid Compass is supported by a grant through the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, which is an agency of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Skid Compass was developed through a partnership between the Immune Deficiency Foundation, RTI International, the Amer Association of Public Health Laboratories, with support from Expecting Health, and the Skid Angels for Life Foundation. To learn about SCID and SCID Compass, please explore our website at www.skidcompass.org. Our website offers a robust variety of online and printable resources for anyone eager to learn more about this condition or share information with others. Topics cover every step in a family SCID journey from diagnosis to return home and everything in between. It is also available in Spanish, French, German, Portuguese, and Tagalog by clicking on select a language in the upper navigation. Skid Compass also offers monthly and annual programming and events. In addition to our lunch and learns, we support all of the great programming that IDF offers to the PI community, including forums, Ask IDF, Get Connected groups, and more. We are also always thinking of ways to bring the latest in Skid to you, such as the Skid Compass Summit. We hope you'll save the date for this exciting event coming up later this spring for, on June 23rd and 24th. I would now like to introduce our moderator for this evening's panel. Heather Smith is the mother of two boys born with X-linked SCID and is the president and co-founder of SCID Angels for Life, a nonprofit that helps families of children diagnosed with SCID. Heather has been a volunteer with IDF for over 24 years and currently chairs our steering committee and parent patient advisory board. We are thrilled to have her moderate this evening's discussion. Our panelists this evening are Audrey, Caroline, and Cindy. Welcome everyone. Thank you, appreciate it. Welcome you guys. This is really great that we get this opportunity to talk with each other and see each other instead of just communicating um, on the internet. So this is pretty cool. 
So I'm going to start out um, asking each one of you to introduce yourself and to please give us your connection to SCID, um, whether that's you know yourself as a patient or whether you have a child, et cetera. So we'll start with um, Cindy first, and if she could introduce herself, that'd be great. Sure. Hi, my name is Cindy Kissick, and I am a patient with uh, adenosine deaminase deficiency, so ADA SCID. I was, I'm 40 years old now. I was diagnosed when I was about three and a half or four years old, and I'm trying to become more active, I guess, in, the, in this community, so. Well, we're excited to have you here, so thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Audrey, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Audrey Dugan. I am 30 years old. I live in San Diego. I am connected to SCID because I have a three and a half year old son with x like SCID. Great, thank you for joining us on the uh, West Coast this late <laughs> afternoon for you. <laughs> um, Caroline, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm Caroline Nockham, I am 34 and I found out that I was a carrier for ABA SCID um, when my first child, was about three and a half months old. Um, we live in Virginia and at the time, Virginia did not have SCID under its newborn screening panel. And so when she became ill, um, our immunologist decided to test her for ADA SCID. And when she was positive for that, um, he had my husband and I also genetically tested. So it was, she was about three and a half, four months old when we found out that we were both carriers. Wow. Well, so as you can see, each person on here has a little bit different story. Um, we've got two ADAs and two excellent, if you consider <laughs> myself an excellent carrier, which I am. So we did not plan it that way, but that is just the way that it happened to work out. So um, next, I'd like to dig into things a little bit more. And I want to ask you, how and when did you find out you were a genetic carrier of SCID? Um, and I'll start in the back and we'll start with Caroline this time. Yeah, so I, I briefly mentioned, so my daughter was diagnosed when she was about three and a half months old. Um, and we had a fantastic immunologist um, in DC and he suspected that it was specifically ADA SCID um, as opposed to other genetic forms of SCID. So he was actually able to send out um, her blood work to Duke where they could test her ADA levels. Um, and we got those back pretty quickly within about three or four days, whereas an official genetic test can take a couple months. So we knew a few days um, after he suspected that she had ADA skid that she did in fact have it because she had zero ADA. Um, so I was 26 years old. My daughter was three and a half months old and it was our firstborn. Um, and kind of like our first introduction to parenthood and skid all at once. Frightening, <laughs> frightening for sure. And I'm sure that waiting period while you were waiting for those test results to come back seemed like it lasted an eternity. <laughs> yeah, we were, uh, we were in the hospital while this was all happening. Um, and I guess just that, you know, our immunologist thought that it was ADA skid and then he started telling us more about it. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I, I kind of hope that's not what it is. But once we actually got the answer, it was a relief because we finally knew what was the cause for everything that was happening with our daughter. And now that we had, um, you know, the results, we could go ahead and pursue treatment and, you know, try to get her better. Whereas the first three months of her life, we were all just scratching our heads trying to figure it all out. So it was um, not the diagnosis that parents want, but it was certainly a relief. Yeah, for sure. I, I can imagine that you felt like once you got the diagnosis, at least you could get on the correct road to, um, you know, an eventual recovery. But when you don't know what you're dealing with, it's pretty hard to do that for sure. So mm -hmm. thank you. Um, Audrey, would you like to go next and kind of tell us how um, and how and when you found out that you were a genetic carrier of skin? Sure. So I actually found out the same exact phone call that I got my son's diagnosis on. Um, 
the way our hospital and situation worked is my son failed his newborn screening, like a lot of skid babies do now that every state is screening. And it came as a complete surprise. We did some confirmatory testing, were sent to the NICU. And at that point, they were, you know, asking me questions about family history to try to figure out, you know, was it possibly to George? Could it be skid? We weren't really sure. So we did a bunch of testing in the NICU. And while he was in the NICU, my husband and I did blood work while we were there. And so they actually sent out all of our blood work together at the same time. And we were discharged to go home. And about two weeks after we were out of the hospital, I got the phone call of Dean's diagnosis of X-Link skid. And then also that I was a carrier, which like I said, was a big surprise because I, I didn't have any like family history or any way to foresee that as a possibility. And so after I found out I was a carrier, I actually immediately thought of my sisters because I have two sisters as well. And so we, since then, they've both been tested and my mom and none of them are carriers. So I'm actually a de novo mutation. I'm the first one in my family, which I don't know what the odds are on that either, but um, I'm very grateful that they are not. So that's just kind of how I ended up finding out. So it was a lot to process. I'm not sure that I initially gave much thought to myself being a carrier. I think there was the immediate like, oh man, that might cause me some problems. But I was so focused on what I was going to do with my son that it was kind of like on the address later list at that time when I found out. Yeah, I get I get that for sure. Address later, like maybe a few <laughs> years down the road when you want to think about <laughs> yeah. more children. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> he was your first. So mm -hmm. I'm sure yeah. you probably had maybe I don't know if you and your husband had talked about having more than one child or not. But mm -hmm. um, oh, know. yeah, we both assume like I just assumed I would have more than one kid. We both come from families of four. So we're used to having siblings, both of us. So yeah, there was the immediate like, oh man, how am I going to have another kid? But really at that point, it was all about him. But eventually I got to address that, that stuff. So. Well, great. And, and Cindy, what about you? How, um, how would you like to, and I'm anxious to hear your answer for, for this question <laughs> as a patient. <laughs> yeah, so it was interesting. I'm going to kind of throw a story in. I was diagnosed a little bit more latently than normal skid children. I was sick when I was a baby, but it wasn't to that extreme that other babies. So I don't know why, honestly, I don't. It just kind of was the luck of the draw, if you will. So I, um, when I was finally diagnosed, it was about three and a half or like I said. And so I, we went into our hospital and we, you know, kind of got myself tested. Oh, that's what this is. Well, then immediately my sister, uh, they did a blood draw on my sister to make sure that she also did not have uh, ADA skin. And then that's when they found out, well, she doesn't have it, but she's a carrier. And I was like, oh, am I a carrier too? You know, cause I'm four years old. I'm super important. It's like really important for me to find out at four, you know? And so I was like, am I a carrier too? They're like, yeah, you're a carrier too. And I said, okay. And so it was basically like, as soon as they took the blood test, they just kind of let us know. And also my parents were then, you know, like we were kind of all, it was almost like a little like testing day, if you will. And we all kind of did it to get together. Uh, and so we, that's when we found out. And luckily it kind of stopped with my sister and me thus far. My nephew does not have, is not a carrier now. So that's something that, you know, we were kind of concerned about too, because, you know, my sister was a carrier. So, uh, but yeah, that's kind of how we found out. So your sister has one child then, is that what you're saying? Yes, she does. Okay. Okay. Does she talk about having any other children or does she feel like having one healthy one was, was lucky and yeah, you know. I think that's, yeah, I think that's kind of what it was. It was more or less, and, and honestly, I just don't know that it was in the timing for them. And it kind of really worked out. And he's like, amazing. And 
the best thing that happened to the family. He's like, and he's the golden grandchild. So I don't know that he wants anybody else in there either. But um, <laughs> so, but I think that that was kind of the same thing. She never really verbalized it, but she did say, I just, I'm really glad that he's safe and healthy. Yeah. So I think that that might be a big part of it. Yeah. Well, so Audrey, I have a question for you because I'm a carrier and I have an older sister who's not a carrier. So it's just my sister and I, and I'm the carrier. Um, and I was so grateful that she was not, and you go through that initial, but then I went through a little period where I was like, well, why am I the one that had to draw the bad card and, and, and not her, she's the older one. Why did it have to happen to me? Did, did you ever go through anything like that? Or is it just me? <laughs> I actually didn't, but I think the only, maybe one of the reasons why is I'm not sure that either one of my sisters are going to have children and I desperately want Dean to have cousins. And so I was like, they really don't need any more like barriers to like having my son have cousins, especially because I didn't know if he'd have siblings. I was like worried about, well, what kids is he going to get to grow up around if I potentially am not going to have any more children? That was kind of immediately where my head went. And I was like, well, maybe he'll be able to have like cousins. And I don't know, before they found out, we had like my sisters and I kind of talked to like, oh, well, if we, you know, have to do IVF, maybe we could do it together kind of thing if they were a carrier with me. Um, I was just happy too that we found out because Dean is the first grandchild in my family. So for it to, to present as Skid and be a boy the first time and for him to have it and to be able to avoid any like further like complications or something. I was just grateful that we found out, you know, early. I, I think I had feelings around, you know, being sad that I was a carrier, but I haven't experienced it for them. I really was just like hoping somebody would be able to give me like some friends. <laughs> Well, that's, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. So yeah. And my, and my sister went on to have two kids and like I said, she's not a carrier. So, um, you know, so my yeah. son has cousins, so that's a great thing too, but yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just different for, for everybody. I feel like, you know, that reaction is totally valid as well. It's just, you know, everyone's different. I was just a little bit more looking forward to him having somebody around, whether that was a sibling I could give him or maybe a cousin or something else just to give him family to grow up with. Oh, I think that's great. I think that's great. All right, so my next question for you is, how does being a carrier or a patient affect your mental health? Ooh, this is a loaded question because <laughs> it's full of all kinds of answers. Um, so let's see, Caroline, would you like to go first? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, um, well, being a carrier specifically, um, I, it has not really, it, it, it doesn't really, it hasn't really bothered me that much, um, just like knowing that I'm a carrier. However, being a carrier and a parent that's just starting out, um, the effects of that can turn into like the, you know, what do you do with family planning? Like Audrey was saying, you know, is she going to be able to have more children? This is her firstborn. And with us, it was the same, same thing. This is our first child. This was also the first grandchild on my side of the family and my husband's. And we certainly wanted to have more kids. Um, you know, and so, and certainly mental health, uh, my mental health was certainly affected be just having a, a child with skid, not necessarily being a carrier, but, you know, when she was well enough, um, we kind of went through the different options of family planning. Um, and, and that wasn't easy either because we had to weigh, there's several different options. We could have another child naturally um, and with specifically with ADA skids, since my husband and I are both carriers, each pregnancy has a one in four chance of the child um, being an affected skid 
um, baby. And so we, you know, consider, do we have a child naturally and take the chance that, you know, the child is born with skid, like our firstborn. Um, and if they are, then what do we do? Is that child going to be lucky um, in terms of not getting ill uh, until they have treatment and treatment is successful, like with Eliana, or will they not be as lucky as her? And is, is you know, if, if not, will we be able to even handle the consequences of that? Um, we briefly talked about adoption, fostering, um, just stopping with one child. We talked about um, IVF, which is ultimately what we chose um, because we, we wanted to have more children. However, we wanted to make sure that they would not have to go through the things that Eliana, our firstborn, went through. We wanted to make sure that, you know, they would be healthy. And in so doing, we were able to do um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is um, IVF, where they test each embryo um, for, for the specific skid variant that we carry. Um, and so that's how we had our son um, who came uh, two and a half years after our daughter. And if it was up to me, I would still be adopting and fostering and having a million more children. Um, but they, I have a partner who also has a say in family planning, so that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I'll take all the babies. <laughs> I, even told, I even told my husband, you know what, we should adopt every child that has any kind of medical illness because we are now well equipped. We know what we're doing. We know how to deal with doctors. Um, so maybe one day. <laughs> and uh, and his response he was sounds his like response, maybe. Um, I yeah, cannot say it on camera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> but, but basically, um, I, I I did. I really wanted to adopt. I wanted to have a natural child, another child naturally, because despite Eliana having skid, she's so amazing. And I would do it all over again a million times. Um, but he convinced me that IVF really is for our family situation, not for everybody. Um, ultimately what is best, you know, if we do have another skid child, Eliana would have to go back into isolation because we wouldn't divide them. You know, would we be able to, you know, keep that child healthy again? And honestly, when I was pregnant with my son, I, it was such a relief knowing that, you know, throughout my whole pregnancy that I knew that he was healthy. Oh my gosh, what a relief it was. Mm -hmm. And my mental health still, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's something that I am working on every day. Um, it's, I'm very open about it. I get nervous about um, germs. I get nervous about my daughter, um, not even with germs. I just, um, I get nervous sometimes. Uh, and I feel like it has a lot to do with just being a parent um, and then being a parent to a child that has had severe medical issues and that will, you know, we're, we're, it's going to be a lifelong thing. Not that she has severe medical issues for the rest of her life, but just that she will need to be monitored for the rest of her life. And I want to make sure that she is always happy and always healthy. Um, and even after my husband and I pass, I want to make sure that she has an advocate, um, you know, that will care for her. So even after life, I will be worried. <laughs> it, it's our job, right? Our job. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and all of us, um, either knew that we were carriers uh, as the patient or had already had our children pre-COVID. So, I mean, this is even before COVID, we were, we were, we were the big germaphobes. So COVID is kind of, COVID is kind of like a piece of cake for us because we're, we were already equipped with how to handle. <laughs> and I'm sure Cindy would agree with that too, with, um, with how to handle life as a, as a patient and having to be cautious and whatnot. So, wow. All right, um, Cindy, would you like to go next and answer the question about um, about how does being a care, how does being a patient affect your mental health? Wow, this is how long do we have? I'm just well, we've got time for your answer. So <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so 
it's this is I'm I'm really glad that we're addressing this because I think as you know this is very important to me to bring this up as as, as much as possible. When I uh, I underwent gene therapy in 1991 uh, after the first person had uh, underwent it first, and at that time, not for any other reason, it wasn't as much of a thing to check the mental health. It wasn't like it wasn't there. It was just kind of on the back burner because we were kind of worried more about the physical health and, and what was going to transpire after that. And so luckily my mother was a nurse. And so she uh, was like, yeah, we're, we're gonna have to do something about this. And so I think she attempted to try to get me some help at the time, but it was very, it was very difficult because as a nine-year-old child, being able to talk about my mental health was like, yeah, I feel fine. Like kind of like, how was school? Good. You know, that kind of thing. So you don't really want to divulge as much because you're still trying to figure out what it is that you're going through anyway. Well, since I've gotten older and have grown up and now I actually work in the mental health community, I understand the importance of spreading the awareness of mental health. Like it's okay to talk about it as early as possible. And like we tell our kids as, as, as young as you can that like, hey, sometimes this stuff happens, but luckily there are things we can do about it now. Uh, so, I mean, and I've, I have a psychologist, I have a psychiatrist, that kind of stuff. So that kind of always helps me uh, kind of keep me even keeled, if you will. But I had to, uh, there's a lot of mental health disorders that I don't know that came with the skid. I think that a lot of them you know, we, we all figured out ultimately that many of us have very similar diagnoses, which is interesting, but then how to best deal with that, the age that I am versus the age that the other people are, et cetera. So, uh, so mental health wise, I have struggled quite a bit, but I also believe that being as old as I am and as young as I was then when it wasn't really talking the nineties versus the 2020s, you know what I mean? Like it's a little different, uh, but I do believe that having that support system really helped me out in that aspect. Um, do you want me to can, like go on with like the family planning part of it? Sure. Okay, I'll just touch on this really quickly. So that probably has been the biggest kind of um, mountain, if you will, we've had to kind of uh, go over at this point. We have come to realize that my body is not going, I'm not going to be able to have children. And this is from a lot of the procedures and everything like that. So now it was up to my husband and I to figure out, well, what are we going to do instead? And so like Caroline, we're like, well, what if we do this adoption thing? Because if, you know, if something, and this is like any other woman in the world that like, if something's not working properly, we'll like try something else, right? It's no different than anyone else. Um, so we're looking into the fostering, we're looking to the adopting. I mean, right now we have fur children, we have a, well, we had a cat and we have a dog and they're uh, very much like need us at all times. I mean, you I feel like they are like the children that they should just uh, morph into humans. So that's kind of like what's been keeping us at this point. But I realized that it's not the end of the world for me not to have a family if that's not in the cards for me. And um, I work in, I work with children at my occupational therapy job. So I feel like I got all the kids I need if I really need to, you know, have that, that fix, if you will. But ultimately, I feel like, and it's the healthiness. My husband was very nervous even before we figured out. We just, it was just recently that we kind of talked to my physician and realized that this was not the best move for us. But even before that, he said, you know, I really don't want to put you in any situation where it would be harmful. And so I don't know that I'm ready for you to have to do something like that if there's a chance that it might hurt you or the baby. And so it was just from then on, we decided, okay, then I guess we're adopters. That's what we're going to look into doing. And that was okay with us. We were, about that mental health part of it was like, okay, who can we talk to about going through this healthfully, you know, versus that, you know, the resentment and the anger and the worry of not being able to be a parent versus the, okay, let's be proactive about this. So that's kind of where my mental health has come full circle. Well, I think it sounds to me like you and Chris are really on the same page because I know you guys have been married for a while. So it sounds like you're, you've come to that decision together and you're both on the same page with it. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Do you mind me asking, because you mentioned something about um, uh, a therapist, a psychologist and um, psychiatrist, 
do you mind me asking around what age you started seeing somebody like that and 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 because because your journey started like you said before the era of really making mental health um you know more of a public service announcement which is mm -hmm. you know it is out there all the time now how did you get comfortable with the fact or was it your family that helped you realize that maybe a therapist would be helpful to for you to work through some things and to be a sounding board and guidance and, and whatnot so it was well, my my mother and father are always very they've been very verbal and we're a big we're we're ethnic, we're Romanian, so we like to talk a lot anyway. And so we were always talking to one another about problems and we never kept anything in the dark within my, even my extended family. It was always like, how are you feeling? Is everything okay? You know, like, do you need to talk about it? But then what they realized was my talking to the extended family is very fine, but that's not getting what I need from it because it's just like, and again, I think the biggest part of it that made it so hard for me is that nobody got it. Nobody mm -hmm. understood. And I was like this, you know, I think I, I had first started going to see my therapist. Um, she was great. It was like, I was like 11 years old, but I remember thinking at 11 years old, like this woman doesn't understand because, and it's not that that means, that doesn't mean anything. This is just an 11 year old mind, right? This, this woman doesn't know what I'm going through. It's really hard to talk to her. And I don't know if she, if I can even verbalize how I'm feeling because it, it, to me, it's like, oh, it seems silly. I shouldn't worry about this when there are so many other things happening in the world. And this is one little thing and that kind of thing, right? So we all, we all kind of have that. But um, once it was probably when I was about 14 or 15, when I actually started realizing that it's like totally okay to, to talk to someone and find, and, and it's okay to find somebody that works for you. And I think that was the biggest kind of key for me was, you know, I think I was, Probably when I kind of got back out, um, out of college, I had, I, my other therapist had retired. So when I got out of college, I was like, you know, I got to find somebody else because there's a lot of stuff going on. And this is about where Chris and I were about to get married and all this good stuff. So but I got to do something, found a therapist and realized, you know, this person is awesome, but not awesome for me. So I'm going to try to find somebody else instead of just putting the whole thing. And I think that's where it's so at, at like 11 to 12 years old is when I kind of started, but then I don't think I understood how to verbalize what I was feeling or how to actually divulge everything until I was like a little bit more of a teenager. Wow, that's, I appreciate that perspective because um, my son as a 26 year old started seeing um, a therapist um, when his dad and I went through, we're going through a divorce. Um, so he was uh, as a teenager and I think he connected with the therapist, but he stopped going to him once he went off to college. And now I think it's hard for him to understand that even though, or even though, you know, life health wise is going great for him, a therapist can be more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, they can be more than that person for you to talk about your health issues with or, or those kind, you know, those kinds of issues and problems. And so um, I like hearing about your journey and how it took, um, you know, several different paths before you really mm -hmm. connected and found what was right for you. So that's great. That's great. Um, all right, Audrey. Do you want me to repeat the question or do you? <laughs> no, I think I remember. So um, I think as far as like mental health goes around family planning, I had kind of mentioned to start that was kind of on my address later list. And I first like started thinking about it a little bit again, when my son was in the hospital, like going through treatment, I was just like, I can't imagine like doing this again. And I felt like very certain that I was not going to be able to do that again. And I think like, you know, the people that do know I'm a carrier, like I have been asked like, oh, do you feel, or did you feel guilty or anything like that when you found out that, you know, you passed this on? And I truly didn't, I truly didn't. Um, I had no idea. I had no way of knowing. So it actually was like, nice to be able to say like, no, I don't feel guilty. I had no idea. 
And now I do. And so the now I do part was like a little bit stressful because it's like, well, now that I do, like, what am I going to do kind of thing? And so I was pretty certain when he was in the hospital that I was like, I'm either not having any more kids or, you know, I'm going to do IVF or I'm going to adopt, like just trying naturally just didn't feel right for me for those reasons, because mentally I was able to handle you know, being a carrier initially and not feeling those feelings, I never want, wanted to potentially experience those feelings if people were asking me that question. You know, I didn't really even think about it until people asked me. And so that was kind of weighing on me mentally. And then, you know, I kind of mentioned like I did have, you know, a period of like sadness where I was like, well, this like, you know, isn't great. Now I do have to do something with this information at some point, you know, whether that's like permanent, you know, avoidance of some sort or something, because I knew that that wasn't the answer for me was to just have another kid naturally. So that part was like stressful too, is like, how am I gonna, now that I feel like that's the right choice for me, like I need to make sure that that happens or like, I was very scared of that, like getting pregnant unexpectedly, which was stressful. And then the way, and then once Dean was like through treatment and things had settled and he was doing really well, I then started to get like a little bit anxious of like, okay, but what if I did do IVF? Like, what does that even look like for me? Because I also am like very afraid of needles. Like, I do not do well with medical stuff in general, which is surprising because now I have a, a kid with a lot of medical complications, but I was, I couldn't imagine myself being able to do that like in reality. And so I ended up reaching out to a therapist at that point. I think Dean was probably about seven months old or something. And just kind of like sharing with her, like the feelings of like not knowing really what my options were or what that would look like, or if I felt like I could do certain things, if I could do IVF, et cetera. I just didn't know anything about it and not having the information was bothering me because I'm very much a planner. So it was like, if I at least have some information, maybe that would make me feel better. And so she, my therapist, like encouraged me to, you know, actually follow up and do my genetic counseling appointment that I had been putting off because, you know, I was so focused on my son and then, you know, going to an IVF clinic and doing a consultation, if she thought that would help me understand what it would look like for me and what my options were. And that was really nice. Just having like an objective outlet to kind of spew some of those feelings at and not have any questions of like, well, why are you already worrying about that? You know, your son's only seven months old, like chill. But at the same time, it felt like very separate diagnoses, like his own and my own. And I felt like I had been just ignoring it. And so it became important mentally for me to address it and get the information, which I think really ended up helping me in the long run, just kind of deal with it in general. I, yeah, I can relate to that for sure. And this isn't anything that we've discussed before, but it's something I want to ask. And anybody who wants to chime in can. Did any of you find that um, it was hard to talk to your friends? Because one, they don't know the day to day of what it's like to have a child with skid and the weight of everything that comes along with it. Um, and secondly, they're, they're in most cases able to go and have their own children. Mm -hmm. So they don't really know what that feels like. So, um, I can imagine for you, Audrey, that going and and talking to a therapist, even if it was when Dean was seven months old, must've been, um, a weight lifted off Mm -hmm. of your shoulders. Even, I mean, I know you felt like it gave you the tools that Mm -hmm. you needed, but you must've felt a heaviness come off of your shoulders Mm -hmm. too. Yeah, definitely. Cause I think like I, when I did try to 
you know, confide in other people like friends or even family. I did get a lot of like, well, you might change your mind. Like when I was so certain that, you know, having another kid naturally wasn't the option for me and that I was either done with kids or going to pursue something else. And that reaction was, you know, interesting. It's like, well, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to change my mind. Like I just went through a bone marrow transplant and chemo with my newborn, you know, and I think it does take like a little bit of, um, you know, I just had to understand that, you know, they didn't experience like what I experienced. So any like opinion or like thought or question of like, oh, well, maybe you'll change your mind or et cetera. You know, it comes from a place where they haven't had to experience it. And that's an incredible privilege. And I just remind myself that, you know, being able to just have an opinion about something is really, really nice. Having to actually experience it firsthand and make the hard choices and actually figure this out. And it's not a hypothetical. This is like an actual decision. Um, and that, that kind of helped me just, if anything ever kind of bothered me just to kind of let it roll off my back kind of thing, because that you don't ever get someone's un, like decisions until you're in their shoes. And for this specific topic, especially the answer is different for every person and there is no right answer. So I think it's, yeah, it was tough. Like in having the therapist instead of, you know, friends or anyone else was really nice. And just to be able to say it out loud, I think was therapeutic, I'm, you know, sure. like mm -hmm. I wasn't even used to talking about, oh, my son had a bone marrow transplant. You know, I like went back to work pre COVID and I wasn't even like able to really talk about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just like being able to like practice speaking about like the trauma was really helpful, like for the future. Uh, yeah. And Cindy, you as a patient, I mean, I, I don't know if you have any lifelong friends that have watched you go through everything that you've gone through that, um, you know, you still confide in today. Um, but I mean, that this must have been... Um, and uh, not awkward, that's not the right word. It must have, must be hard to have that conversation about children with your, with your acquaintances, with your friends that you have now because they may not know everything that you've been through. And so, um, you know, they don't know what all would be involved. Am I putting words in your mouth or is that true? No, you're very right on. That's very spot on. Um... I, my, I, the lifelong friends totally understand. They get it. They're like, no, there's no, there's no questions there. There's no even inquiries. The uh, acquaintances are like, the, so I work for a school uh, with a culture that has upwards from like anywhere from four to nine children. That's like their norm. And so for me, not having a child, all these children are asking me, well, when are you going to become a mommy? And why aren't you a mommy? And this kind of thing continues and continues. So I come home and I'm like upset one day and I realize like, oh, wait, I can't, they, it's not their fault. They don't understand why, you know? And, uh, but then I realized that I think that was kind of when I had that epiphany that it's okay if I have a child, it's okay if I don't, you know, whatever way we decided like the adoption, but um but yes, it is difficult because as soon as we got married, that's the first question out of everyone's mouth is, when are you having your babies? Well, how many babies are you going to have? And it's like, all right, dude, yeah, do you have time? Do you want to sit down and talk about this? Like, let me, let me just bend your ear, you know, because that's kind of how I felt at the time. Uh, but later, I mean, I have no problem. I'm also a very open book. I will have no problem sharing anything that happened in my life and how we're feeling now and what exactly is going on. I think it's just more or less like the assumptions. So instead of assuming, just ask me, I'll tell you about it. It's not, it, you know, it's not a big deal to me, but don't assume this, you know, oh, well, they're just not kid people. I've gotten that so many times mm -hmm. that it's like, but that's not what this is. It's not that we're, you know, and it's okay for people to not choose to have children. That's wonderful. 
But just because someone's not doesn't mean that they're not kid people. I think that's kind of where the acquaintance part or that where you're not, you know, uh, not your lifelong friends. They don't really understand. And then you don't know what to say sometimes. And you're just kind of like, oh, uh, yeah, cool. You know, so yeah, so it is a little difficult. I agree. Caroline, I don't want to cut you off. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that or if you want me to go um, to the question about um, the importance of self-care, whichever one you'd like to go to, take a stab at. Um, yeah, I can I can talk about self-care. I, I also wanted to, before I talk about self-care, um, briefly just mention that um, uh, I really appreciated um, how in the midst of my daughter's diagnosis, uh, we were in the hospital and my mother, um, like the first day was in total denial. Like this, it's not even possible that she has skid and everybody's exaggerating. And my dad just like looked at her and was like, this is what it is. And the very next day she completely like turned her attitude around and really impressed upon me the attitude that I have now, which is like, you know, Eliana is just so cool that she has skid, you know, like not everybody can have skid, you know, kind of like, you know, it, it, she was being comical at the time, but that's kind of like how I see it now too. Like, uh, you know, our, our son, we went through IVF with him, all of our embryos either had skid or were carriers. We did not have any embryos that were pre and clear of all ADA skid genes. And so I, I even have this attitude, like, you know, to be a part of this family, you have to at least be a carrier. It's just an, it's just like a, a, a knock them attitude, you know, like it's, it, it's kind of like we, we make it sound cool, you know, and it, it's almost like a competition between my parents who have not been tested. Um, you know, they both, they both kind of want to have the gene because it's, you know, Eliana's so awesome and we're so awesome. And so they also want to have the ADA skid gene which you don't really want to have, um, but that's just kind of the attitude that we have. Um, I think it just puts kind of a positive spin on things. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, in terms of self-care, uh, like uh, Audrey and Cindy, I also have been seeing a therapist. Um, there was, I, I actually, I, I, I've seen a, a few therapists even before I became a parent, um, but then certainly once Eliana was diagnosed, I was hesitant because I didn't want to leave the house. I didn't want to be around other people because I didn't want to bring home any illnesses to my immunocompromised child. Um, my husband and I were not um, having a very positive marriage at that point and so that kind of like forced me to go out and and seek help um you know with my mask on and my gloves and sanitizing the couch that they had me sit in <laughs> and every therapist I've, I've been to a couple and and every single one of them you know were very accompanying of that and understanding um and things seemed to get better and then there was actually one night pre-covid my daughter was in preschool and um i had I had noticed that while she was in preschool, I started to become even more and more of a germaphobe, even though, despite several physicians telling us that we needed to relax some of our um, protective conditions that Eliana was well enough to be in preschool. She was well enough to have some germs. And for me, it just seemed to become even more severe where I, you know, I didn't want to touch anything and my germophobia kind of really surfaced at that point. And there was one night where I spent two hours washing my hands and I could not put my kids to bed because I couldn't stop washing my hands. And once I finally put my kids to bed, I turned to my husband and I said, you know, if I didn't have kids right now, I would go and check myself into a mental hospital because I, I knew that that that's not okay. That's not normal. Um, there was no reason to wash my hands for two hours. And so the very next day I made an appointment with a physician um, to put me on anti-anxiety, antidepressants, and also with um, a, a therapist that was recommended to me by another mother who also has a child with very severe medical conditions. Um, I did that immediately and both uh, certainly helped a lot. I am, it's been three years now, I'm still taking the same medication. Um, and I did stop seeing the therapist because, you know, 
my life is seen, you know, seems to be going pretty well now. Um, and I don't wash my hands for two hours anymore. <laughs> Though that could happen again. <laughs> so I don't think that there's any, you know, I, I'm not ashamed that I'm on antidepressants or anti-anxiety because it's certainly, you know, it's, it's certainly helped me have a relatively normal life, um, you know, where I can send my kids to public school, they can be around kids that are sneezing and, um, you know, and, and I can allow that to happen where I don't freak out about it. Um, so certainly if there's something going on with your family, go seek help. Um, however, that may be because, you know, things, things can usually get better. That's a great answer. I like that. Thank you for sharing, for being so open with that. I appreciate that. Um, Audrey, would you like to go next and talk about the self-care? Sure. Um, I feel like I could always have more self-care. I don't know if anyone else feels like that, but I feel like when I can tell when I do really need to like talk to someone or, you know, do even just like a few sessions of therapy for something will like help me so much. So obviously when needed, I rely on that, but really like, because I do have a three and a half year old and stuff, my self-care is like any alone time that I can have like a good shower, you know, a face mask. I like would always love to like end my like hard day in the hospital with like a shower and just like something that makes me feel like I'm taking care of myself um, you know, going outside. Like I said, I live in San Diego, so I'm very fortunate that it's usually really nice outside every day. So that really helps my, my mood and helps me take care of myself as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's just in general, like knowing what works for you as a person and what can kind of help you relax and work through things. And, um, you know, even if it's not a lot of alone time or, you know, something big, it, even the little things, if you, you know, make time in your day for like little bits of things and little bits of time, you know, to take care of yourself, like helps me feel better, especially with working from home. You know, you get in the habit of, you know, staying in your pajamas and working all day. I learned a long time ago, I could not do that. So it's like having like structure to my day is like self-care to me too. Because if I just immediately start doing for everyone else, then normally that doesn't really go as well for me. So, well, and I don't think we can be a good mom or a good parent mm -hmm. if we're not taking care of ourselves, right? Yeah. I mean, I think mm -hmm. we're, we're better as, as a parent when, when we do take care of ourselves. So mm -hmm. Cindy, what about you? What do you, what, what do, you do for self-care? So I'm a big exerciser. I love weightlifting. I love hiking. We love being outside. Um, but that Audrey hit the nail on the head with um, a routine. I realize that when I don't have my routine, I feel like everything's kind of in disarray. And it could be anything, but like that consistency is kind of what really helps me to stay focused and to stay calm. And again, if I don't have that consistency, then that's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's just something that I have to kind of regroup and remember, oh yeah, I do this because this makes me feel calmer and feel better. Um, I'm a big advocate for going to get massages and all that when they're not astronomically expensive, <laughs> because right now in this area, there's so, there's so much money and I can't do it right now. So then I'm asking my husband, hey, do you want to get me one of those nice massage massages so we don't have to pay $120? But um, you know, so it's that kind of thing where we, uh, but honestly, just spending time with family and not doing anything. That's probably one of my favorite things is just having them come over, having my best friend come over and we just sit there, we look at pictures or we watch a Disney movie and we call it a night that I just feel like being around people or being outdoors and moving. Those are the three things that keep me very much uh, in my, my happy place. I like that. <laughs> my happy place is the beach. So <laughs> my feet with my feet in the sand. So yeah, 
Um, all right. Well, before we wrap things up and go and switch over to um, the Q&A session, um, I just didn't know if there was any last minute um, thoughts that anybody wanted to share, wanted to make sure um, they said that maybe you didn't get it, didn't didn't to get an opportunity to say. Um, if so, we can do that now, or otherwise we can switch over to um, the questions and answers. I um, will jump in briefly, because I feel like I never got to the point where I said what I ended up doing, which is I did, my husband and I, we were right in our initial feelings that not having another child naturally was the right answer for us. And we did end up doing IVF. And I'm actually currently nine months pregnant. So Yay. that's pretty exciting. Yay. And so, yeah, I'm having a girl and she will not have skid and it's going to be a very different experience. I feel like I'm about to be like a first time parent in a lot of ways. I'm sure Caroline can relate. It's like, I don't know how to leave the house with a baby. So like I didn't use my car seat hardly at all until my son was six months. So there's going to be a lot of firsts to figure out this second time around, but, um, that is ultimately the decision we made. And so I'm sure if people watch this back or anything, if they have any questions about what the IVF process looks like, if you're a genetic carrier or how I got my genetic testing covered by my insurance, which was a very long process or, you know, kind of the factors that we considered and weighed more heavily. I think, like I said before, everyone's decision is their own and there's no right answer. I think though everybody is kind of weighing the same factors and it's just everybody kind of prioritizes what those factors are a little bit differently to come to the answer that's right for them. So I would be happy to have anyone reach out at a, even outside of this to chat about that. But I just wanted to make sure that I concluded where we ended up with our uh, family planning decision. So well, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you did say that and congratulations. And Thank you've you. got a few more weeks to go and then mm -hmm. baby will be here. She'll be here. Yeah. So that's, ex that's exciting. Well, so we do have a question in here um, from one of our audience members. And I think I could maybe ask it to both of you guys, to both um, Caroline and to Audrey, since you both went through the IVF process. It's a pretty personal question, and I don't know um, if you're going to be comfortable answering it or not. So feel free. Um, if you don't want to do it on the recording, we can always um, we can always type the answer or send the answer to this to this person later, but um, they're wanting to know what happened to the embryos when doing IVF for the ones that were positive for either ADA or for X-Link skid. And are either one of you comfortable with answering that? Yeah, I can start. So um, it is my understanding that um, different IVF centers have different uh, rules or standards for that. Um, so for example, there are some IVF centers that will not even um, allow their clients to do any HLA testing um, on their embryos. They have um, whatever their reasons may be. Um, and so my husband and I specifically chose an IVF center that did work with a lab. It, they worked with three labs and only one of the labs allowed HLA testing um, on our embryos. So we decided to go with that. Um, as far as the, um, the affected embryos that were confirmed to have skid, the IVF center said that it was up to us. So we could continue to freeze them like we have been doing with our other embryos, or they could be ethically discarded, which I believe means that they, um, they don't freeze them, they just um, put them out where they can defrost and then they would no longer be viable. Um, these embryos are, I believe, um, they are five to six day old embryos. So they, I believe they have about 200 or so cells, but I could be wrong about that. And I'll, I'll have to confirm that um, after this. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we have continued to freeze hours simply because we it's it's not any more money if you're freezing one or if you're freezing 10. So we have other 
um, unaffected embryos that we are freezing. So we, uh, we just haven't discarded them. Um, however, I don't, I personally don't um, see anything wrong with discarding an, an embryo that you know that you will not be using. Um, we also, we actually um, reached out to a physician to see if they wanted to use um, one of our skid embryos um, for medical research. Um, that was turned down only because apparently that used to be like a hot ticket years ago, but that it's not really something that they really need right now anymore. Um, so personally, we're just freezing ours for now indefinitely. Thank you for answering that. Um, I know we're at eight o'clock, but I want to give Audrey an opportunity to um, give an answer if she'd like to answer that mm -hmm. question too. Yes, I will. So I agree with everything um, Caroline said. Usually it does depend on the clinic and they usually have like three standard options, like either discard, freeze, or donate to research was actually an option for us at our clinic. Um, we decided to put this on the address later list. Um, so all of ours are still frozen. Um, however, I agree. I mean, I don't have any intention of using our affected embryos. However, um, I, as part of like my mental health and just general decision making, I enjoy an address later list. I, at the time, my priority was just getting through the emotions of, you know, receiving those results and not feeling like I needed to make a decision all at the same time, because going through the IVF process in general is a lot. Um, you know, when you're waiting for results, a lot of that is like very, um, familiar, you know? And so I think it just worked out better for me and my husband to just focus on the current goal, which was to grow our family with another healthy child and then leave that on the address later list since, you know, IVF is a lot physically and emotionally. So it was just kind of, it worked out for us to do it that way for now. Well, thank you both um, for answering that. I appreciate it. And like I said, I know we're just after the hour. And I also want to thank all of you um, for agreeing to have this session recorded because I know that there were several people that had messaged that they weren't going to be able to attend live for um, work reasons or for various reasons. So I think it's gonna be really nice to be able to have this available for people to watch um, at, during, at their leisure when, when they have the time to watch it. Um, I have an air show going on outside at home right now that's just starting to <laughs> get very noisy. So maybe that's my cue that um, it's time for me to go. I don't know if IDF wants to come in and say anything else before we sign off, but I do appreciate everybody's time and thank Thank you for being um, so open and honest this evening. This was wonderful. Yes, I definitely want to echo everyone's um, sentiments. We are so appreciative um, of Heather for moderating and for Audrey, Caroline, and Cindy joining us this evening um, and being so open and honest and candid about your experiences. Um, we know this will mean a lot to other parents facing similar health challenges. And we hope that, um, again, by having this recorded, that this can really you know, have a broad reach and help other parents and families and skid patients. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, we have just a couple more things we wanna get through before we officially close it out. Um, and again, thank you so much to our moderator, Heather Smith and our panelists, Audrey, Caroline, and Cindy. Um, to our audience, if you have more questions, you can ask IDF. Um, go to www.primaryimmune.org slash ask dash IDF, or give us a call at the number on your screen um, and ask your questions. We hope you'll remember to take advantage of all of the resources that Skid Compass has to offer, um, including our family planning guide, which is certainly relevant to tonight's topic, um, as well as IDF's new genetic testing webpage, which, which also has some great resources. Um, we also want to highlight our toolkit for parents, which encompasses all of the resources and information found on the Skid Compass website in a printable, easy to read guidebook, um, which parents can bring with them to medical appointments or share with family members who want and need to know more about SCID. 
Um, we want to close out by saying that all IDF programming is guided by the individuals and families we serve in the PI community. Um, and therefore, we hope you'll take a moment to um, scan the code on your screen and take our very brief program evaluation survey. It really does help us inform topics and programs for future lunch and learns and panels like this one. Um, and we will also be emailing out the evaluation to everyone after the webinar. And finally, um, we hope you'll join us for the next Skid Compass Lunch and Learn, where Dr. Mo Dr. Morna Dorsey from UCSF will present on the importance of long-term follow-up for Skid patients. Thank you again so much to our panelists, to our wonderful moderator, and to everyone for joining us for today's program. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening. Thank you.